Tina Kotu, Tina Tata Katoa. Welcome to the Auckland Unitarian Church, a place that has been our home for 118 years. I hope you will find companionship and support here. I hope you will find your concerns are shared. Today, in our sermon, I'm sharing my delight in meeting several dozen newcomers to my street in the last month. There are about 20 of them, and they've been hooning up and down our street uh, at great speed, almost knocked me over several times. They've been hunting and destroying pests around our neighbourhood. They've been doing acrobatic displays in the street, and they've raised several uh, dozen offspring, all in the course of about six weeks. Very energetic people. <laughs> and the answer is they're not people, they're swallows who have um, suddenly appeared in large numbers in our neighbourhood and gave me some uh, food for thought, and I hope it will do the same for you. We especially welcome any visitors. I can't see any of them today, but if, if there are, I, uh, we are glad to have you with us, and we invite you to join us in a cup of tea or coffee afterwards. Welcome. My opening words are from a Jewish songwriter he wrote a song about two and a half thousand years ago, which is now part of the Book of Psalms. He was being bullied by powerful opponents and was in despair. And he asked God to help him find a place where he could escape from this kind of persecution. He, it is not a prayer of hope. I think it sounds to me more like a prayer of despair. He said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove then I would fly far away and be at rest. In the wilderness build me a nest and let re me remain there forever at rest. I light this chalice as a focus for the hopes and joys that we bring here today. By sharing them, we lighten each other's loads and take inspiration from one another. Well, a month ago, I saw one of those most spectacular sights of my life. As I was walking my dog down the street, um, I saw a tiny sparrow swallow fly up to one of the highest um, trees in our neighbourhood, a Norfolk pine, and it got on the uh, top branch of it. And shortly after, um, another um, swallow flew up and, and sat beside the first one on the, on the branch. And then uh, about 10 seconds later, they both went into a dive. <laughs> and they headed off on a downward glide. And they were spiralling and turning left and turning right and turning loops. It was the most amazing uh, acrobatic display. And to my amazement, they all they stayed about that distance apart from each other all that time. And they, I, I wonder how on earth uh, do they synchronise it? How did they know what the other one was going to do? And when I um, looked into it, I, I found, um, to my surprise, looking up uh, bird books about, uh, about swallows, it said um, this was not an amazing coincidence that those two uh, birds managed to swim in fly in formation. This was part of their mating ritual, <laughs> and it's a test. The first stage of the swallows um, meeting of each other is when the male uh, looks for a nest site, and when he's found one, he shows it off uh, to all the um, females who happen to be going past, and if any of them particularly takes a fancy for it, um, that starts his turn on, and then he moves, and then she moves into uh, her first trick, which is to invite the um, male to a contest. <laughs> and it's like, catch me and imitate me if you can. And that's what the way one of these um, bird experts described it. And she is setting the, the, tur the turns and the twists, and he is following her as best he can. And in this case, he was following so well. I could not tell which one was leading. It was really 
um, an amazing uh, act of synchronization and of uh, it was uh, why uh, why are female swallows so worried about how well the, the male swallows can swoop and dive? Well, part of the answer is that's a key to their success in life uh, is catching insects. They live by catching insects. And the one above there, I think it's just called a, a dragonfly, and it's an ideal sort of uh, gift to take to their children when they have some children, of course. But that's the, um, that, that's the purpose of the ritual and why it is so vital. They not only fly to catch insects, but they fly almost the entire day, carrying, doing up to 320 kilometres a day, just zooming all around the place and like crazy things. There's another little display, one wing on one side, one wing on the other side, manoeuvring to catch some tiny insect, which I can just see, but is probably a fly. They don't go for very, very tiny insects like mosquitoes, but flies are just an ideal size snack for them, and they need hundreds of them a day. So that's why it's important to be an amazing acrobat. They do everything while they're flying. Um, not just feeding, they also drink while they're flying. They don't stop to have a drink anywhere. And, in this, and they like to, to live in um, near pools uh, or rivers so they can get a drink. Um, that's the only way they can drink. They don't go for bird baths or anything like that. It has to be a, um, water that they can dive in. Sometimes when they're doing this, they actually dive underwater and enjoy it. But mostly they just skim along with their beak channeling some water up into their mouths. And manoeuvring is a big part of it. They have, for, for a tiny bird, they have absolutely huge wings. The, the bird is about 15 centimetres long. His wingspan is about, about 30 or 40 centimetres long. When they open their wings, they suddenly look like a large bird. This is a video, but I'm not sure it's working, so I'll move on to the next one. There's a video showing um, showing how swallows uh, got to New Zealand. I was very surprised when I saw these swallows in such numbers, because I recall when I was a boy, I never, ever saw a swallow. I, they were something I read about in books from other countries. And, and this was in the 50s. And I remember that um, some people occasionally said they had seen swallows. They were seen, first seen in New Zealand in about 1920, and they were birds that had blown over from Australia in a storm. They normally m migrate um, from the east coast of Australia down to uh, Tasmania. And the occasional one, it seems, got lost or blown away by the storm and ended up here. Now that was, you could call that the first migration, but the um, New Zealand bird authorities don't count that as a migration, they call them vagrants. And vagrants they are because it's a very isolated, miserable life they have. They arrive without any partners, they arrive without any ability to breed. They're like Robinson Crusoe's, living in a friendly country where there's heaps of birds, uh, heaps of insects for them to eat, but that is all they can do. And it wasn't until 1958 that a colony of these birds set up near Kaitaia. And that means that not just one or two uh, blew across the Tasman, but probably dozens of them. Um, and that was their good fortune. Uh, surviving is not sufficient. You need to survive with a community. And in, in Kaitaia, they did that. From there, they spread all over New Zealand. They, um, the shade, different shadings of colour there show which are the um, uh, which have the most of them. Uh, these are judged by sightings in people's gardens. And if you look, the darker colours are um, where the most are seen, and the pale blue is where the fewest are seen. So um, you'll see there's lots of them in the north. And would you believe that the, uh, they, they counted the number of um, 
a number of homes and gardens you'd have to go to to see a swallow. And the, the highest rating of um, five homes and you would see a swallow, um, would you believe, is in Auckland. So we are the favourite spot in New Zealand for, um, for swallows. Uh, followed by the Central North Island. They are a pretty big amount and, and they have plenty. Quite a lot of um, swallows in those areas, but they have migrated everywhere, uh, including right down to uh, excluding Southland and ex excluding a few parts of the South Island. The only, climate, only environments they don't like are mountains and um, um, a, a dense forest. Now that is rather strange in a way because they, they, their rivals in New Zealand, being uh, insect eaters, their rivals are fantails. And the fantails um, you always see when you go, only see, I've only ever seen them uh, when they are, um, when I'm walking along a mountain trail or in the bush somewhere, they like it in the bush and they like it when humans go past because we knock up the um, insects uh, off the ground. Um, but they almost don't overlap in their habitats, although they have got a very similar lifestyle, very similar tails. Um, a, a fantail needs a tail so it can hover and, and dart here and, here and there, and a swallow needs a tail for the very same reason. But the rest of them is quite different. One of the uh, things swallows like most about um, human society is all the buildings we have. And this is one of the reasons uh, they would not have been able to, able to live here uh, before uh, Europeans arrived. They need tall buildings um, with eaves. And Maori don't have any of those, and, uh, or didn't then. And the, um, all our towns are just full <laughs> of eaves. And they like the eaves for one reason, that they, um, it shades, shades them from the sun. Their chicks are very, very vulnerable to heat. And, and the other is um, it's, it's, they, uh, um, they can build a nest, they can attach a nest um, on the wall of a house. Or um, the, the favourite is um, if there's a barn that has got an open door, but uh, you can fly in. Now, in one part, one part of the world, they're called barn swallows because that is their favourite um, kind of roosting place. Um, there are not so many barns in New Zealand, but an ordinary house will do. And they, they go on the shady side and build their nest. Now, once while I was um, walking uh, down our street uh, um, and coming back to our own house, I saw, to my amazement, um, a swallow uh, hovering right around our front door. And by this stage, I'd researched them and found they like shady places to build their nests. And I thought, wonder is he's sizing us up for a... Um, a place for a nest. And so um, I didn't want to disturb him, but I was not going to um, avoid our front door for the next month. So I quietly walked up, and this is what happened. <laughs> he buzzed me. <laughs> he flew straight at me, and eyeballing me from about a metre away. And then he started hovering. We've got a hovering picture. I couldn't get a hovering picture, but it's like that only... Uh, they spread their wings wide, their tails wide, but they're vertical. And he just stood there hovering in front of me. And I was wowed. And so um, I not wanted to annoy him, but not wanting to miss the moment, I got out my camera. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm, I'm gonna, you, don't, you don't seem to want me going somewhere else, but I'm going to take your photo first. I'll show this for comparison. The... Um, Swallow on the left um, looks to me almost like a bird of prey. Uh, very surprising change, but the usual look when they're flying is they're tinier than a sparrow, you can hardly see them. But when they are hovering, they have these broad wings and huge uh, flaps at the end of their wings, the end of their tail. And this is an actual eagle on the right, and they, they, you could almost think they're the same species except that the um, swallow's wingspan is 30 centimetres and the eagle's uh, wingspan is about one and a half metres. A huge bird. And yet they have certain things common. They both hunt in the air 
and that gives them, uh, they need similar wings, if not the same size. And when I got my camera out to look at the bird, there he was. This is the only one of these <laughs> photos that I took myself. But it is after he um, flew into my face, he then flew away up onto one of our power lines. And um, I was very happy to have a camera with a very long lens, <laughs> my, my new camera, uh, I can bring them in and that brought him in. See how he's got um, a little um, uh, orangey coloured tuft under his chin. Uh, that's a sign of a swallow. The double tail, the split tail, is also a sign of swallows. Uh, that's what they look like when they're folded, uh, but when they come out, they look like a fan. And the wings are exceptionally long, even folded as they are there. Uh, you'll notice that they go almost down as far as the tail. Most birds, their wings only stop, like, they're like waistcoats, they stop halfway down their body. But swallow, this is how they managed to get such huge wingspan with such a tiny bird. Well, after he um, flew down on my face, he then flew away and then came buzzing at me from a different angle. <laughs> it was the same thing over again. And I thought, um, he is either very angry or very worried, but I won't stand around and find out. So I went back inside. And then I went up to her. I thought I'd like to see if he was still hanging around. So I went to our upstairs balcony. And would you believe he buzzed me a third time? <laughs> so he is very... Uh, and I figure, from, from looking at him, our house... Does, uh, our balcony would be an ideal spot um, if it wasn't for people going in and out of it all the time. <laughs> but our next door neighbour has a, blo a, a partly a built in um, garage and um, carport. Uh, it's closed on about three sides, and there's a space about this high on the far side. Ideal um, a swallow nest area. And I went and asked our neighbour, I said, I noticed a lot of swallows have been hovering around your house and ours. Do you have any nests there? And they said, yes, there are nests in our, in our, in our neighbour's barn. And that was why he was flying at, at, at me. He was not wanting an, another nest. He was just wanting to take my attention away <laughs> from the real nest, which he, which he did that very well. Another thing that swallows like to do is to eat mud. <laughs> Now, that will seem a very strange um, pastime, but here is one. It's by the edge of a, um, a lake or, or river, and you've got a mouthful of mud from the water's edge. And what do they do with it? Well, they build a nest. And um, they spit the mud out in little balls, and they stick on the side of a wall. It helped if there's a little bit of a ledge, but in that place there's no ledge. Um, it's just a rough part of the, uh, of the concrete. And so that represents about a um, 2,000 spits there. And the, the male is the one who finds the nest site, but the female also helps build, and it's a cooperative effort. They both go flying around and spitting. And then their, their next trick is, of course, as you would guess, mating. But that's the one where they need to do their uh, little dance to impress the female. And uh, it's a consensual sex in swallow territory. Um, if she doesn't want to, he won't do it. And um, the sign that she doesn't want it is she sticks her tail up. <laughs> and and the, the, that's what she's doing in this case. So she's saying, uh, you'll have to impress me some more still. But uh, only a, um, a, a week or two later... The nest, it, the eggs arrive, um, four or five per, per nest, uh, and um, they have uh, three or four um, clutches a year. So they're very prolific birds, raising lots of lots of chicks. There are four of the chicks, um, like any chick, I think, with huge mouths, um, which act as some kind of um, <laughs> turn on for the parents, and they feel they've got to find something nice and stick it in one of those holes. Here is a parent trying to do this. She, he or she is flying up with a mouthful of, of insects, probably, and three chicks uh, out wanting to eat it. 
In fact, they are so eager that this poor um, swallow, can't, the, the, the adult swallow at the bottom, can't even get onto the nest to pass on the food. They're, they're all hanging out over it and they've got no show. There's one, um, the baby is um, on a branch at this stage, so it's off the nest, but still the parent is feeding it. And when they're outside of the nest, um, the parents get this um, full attention from the chicks, even when they fly past. So it's a, it's a very, they're very demanding little things, and they see a lot of flying while they do it. This all um, led me to think these swallows are really uh, amazing migrants. They migrated from Australia. They found a new lifestyle in New Zealand, new lifestyle because they no longer migrate. Uh, they make themselves at home here because we have just the kind of niche that they are used to. Um, then it, it suddenly occurred to me, well, so do we. Um, we have, we and swallows have both migrated over almost the entire planet. This is the picture of uh, human migration. The, um, the blue strips are migrations um, to um, the far left to Europe, where um, Neanderthal humans lived in the Ice Age. Um, they went up to Siberia, uh, the, the one that's turning right, uh, Den they're called the Denisovans, because that's, it's the, um, a town of St. Denis where their um, remains were first seen, and some were even found in Australia. And we think of um, some pride with New Zealanders, uh, uh, um, Europeans arriving here uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and the Maori arriving about 700 years ago, but these guys arrived there about 40,000 years ago. So we have been collectively migrating for an awfully long time. Those red arrows are another a different theory. The, the main one theory is that there were just those three main migrations, but the others are um, different routes, but to the same places. They've got to explain the same fossils um, that are there. So we have been doing this much long, as long as the swallows have. We've been adapting to different environments. They invented a new trick, which we never took on, of um, having two homelands, and so adapting for two places and flying from... They were, that we, did, we, we did that um, in about six million years, all those migrations. They do their migrations every year, twice. So um, a very different lifestyle. They are very much more threatened uh, by this because they only need a, a hiccup in one of their environments for them to be out of business. I took this picture for several reasons. One is it's part of our first history. Those are footprints in ash in um, Ethiopia. And those are the footprints of some of the earliest pre-humans. Um, I think it's... Um, uh, they're called um, Anthropithecus. It means they, they named after the place where those footsteps were found um, in the Afar Peninsula. Those footprints uh, are of three individuals. Um, they thought possibly um, two parents and a child. And it's hard to follow all three sets because one of the three keeps stepping in the footsteps, footprints of the other. So they knew they were walking on this. What they were walking on, um, it's not amazing that they uh, uh, lasted for so long, but they, what they were walking in is volcanic ash. And the um, reason uh, there was so much volcanic ash is the whole of um, Africa at that time was a volcanic scene, and it led to reshaping of the land. And one of those reshapings uh, led to a human split from other kinds of animals that created a different environment on different sides of the split. It's called the Great Rift Valley in Africa, and the volcanoes helped to make it. The reason that um, actually those footprints lasted all those um, um, millions of years is that, uh, uh, by a strange coincidence, after the ash fell, um, rain fell and, and made it mushy, and then uh, more ash followed, and so it grew up two layers 
of sedimentary rock in, in the uh, um, explorers in our time were able to peel the two kinds of rock apart and show those footsteps from, from way back. I also chose that for its scary reminder um, of volcanic ash here only um, a, a few weeks away. And there's White Island with a wrecked helicopter and human footprints in the ash. Um, it makes you realise that we are sort of repeating the precarious existence of our ancestors. And that's one of the, one of the features, that we have lived in scary environments and yet survived. Another thoughtful picture of the bushfires in Australia, um, part of the huge global um, threat to our environment, but the threat hits different people differently. We are not prone to huge bushfires like Australia is. They are, and are very vulnerable, uh, large parts of their, um, their eastern border. You wonder uh, how fit they are for human habitation, but that's part of the scene of global warming. It hits um, worldwide, but it hits people selectively. What makes it even more selective is that when people migrate away from these danger spots, others will try and stop them. And there on the right are um, people in Hungary putting up barbed, barbed wire barriers to stop the migrants from Africa and Syria. So there's um, a horrible side of change of, um, of, of um, environment. Some people are going to guard their environments uh, with, with brutality, and the ones who are, are, are fleeing will be suddenly becoming second-class citizens. And I like this because it's the same place, but it's a sign of hope. Those children um, have just escaped uh, in Hungary under the barbed wire and are making it uh, to Europe. Three um, reminders of the kind of choices that we have today. We too are faced with um, global catastrophes. We too are faced with migrants. We too, many of us, survive the migrations. Many do not survive. And this, these, I think, are the, um, the, the light at the end of the tunnel for me is that, I, that although we face disaster, our ancestors have faced equal disasters. Um, global warming is going to um, make our life hell but so did the Ice Age make Europe hell, and yet our ancestors survived there. And they survived partly by skill and partly by migration. And uh, many of our migrations have been brutal. Um, people invading other parts of the world, the Europeans colonising the rest of the world. So it's a, a, a very mixed blessing. Anyone who says, um, as some people have said, God will look after us, um, we don't have anybody up there looking after us. Um, we have to look after ourselves, and, but we can do it. We have done it over thousands of years and I hope can do it again. And let me say together, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Well, for my closing words, I would simply like to um, repeat those words of the, of the song. Um, a, a wistful thought um, that all of us sometimes feel that hopefully can rise above. Sometimes I wish I had wings like a dove so I could fly away and be at rest. In the wilderness, build me a nest and let me remain there forever at rest. Escapist thoughts, <laughs> but it's part of our feelings about coping with disaster. <laughs>